Hello, everyone, and welcome to the spring semester's first TAP session, which stands for Theory and Practice, which is a collaborative venture between the Center for Studies in Gender and Sexuality at Ashoka University in Delhi and the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality at New York University in New York, which is directed by Gayatri Gopinath. My name is Madhavi Menon, and I direct the Center at Ashoka University. Our session today is going to be a robust and wonderful and fabulous conversation on the subject of bodies, sexualities, and the law. Uh, and I'm just sort of quickly going to introduce to you the, uh, the sort of format that we're going to follow and then introduce our wonderful speakers to you who will then take over and, and share their thoughts with us. Uh, each speaker will speak for about eight to nine minutes each about their initial thoughts on the topic, uh, about their initial ideas, about how their work might uh, connect with the subject and how their work might actually reflect thinking on the subject that it's useful for us to ponder and think about. Um, after that, we'll have, after each of them has spoken, we'll have another 10 minutes of conversation moderated by me among the three of them to think about how their ideas might be enriched by one another's. And following which we will have 20 minutes of Q&A with the audience. And so now it is my cue to tell the audience members that you can post your questions at any point during the entire session, uh, even though we will curate them and then present them to the speakers only during the last uh, 20 minutes or so. So let me introduce you to our speakers for today and they will speak in this order. Um, and our first speaker today is uh, Dean Spade, early in the morning from Seattle. Uh, and he is a lawyer, a trans rights activist, as well as associate professor of law at the Seattle University School of Law. Next, we have Rahul Rao from London, who is senior lecturer in politics at the Department of Politics and International Studies at the London School of Economics. And finally, we will have Flavia Agnes, who is uh, an extremely well-known women's rights lawyer in India and co-founder of Majlis, which is a legal and cultural resource center located in Bombay. And so we'll hear from each of our three speakers in the order that I have introduced them, and then we will have a conversation among them and then with all of you. So without further ado, Dean, Bodies, Sexualities and the Law. Thanks so much. I'm so grateful to be here and be part of this conversation. It's so it's so special to have these conversations across this much space. It's like the opposite time of day <laughs> where you are. So um, uh, it's a really an honor to be part of this conversation. I can't wait to, to learn from um, everyone. Um, and thanks to all the work that went into organizing it. Um, when I think about this question, you know, the main thing that comes to me very much from my US context um, in, in my lifetime as a queer trans activist, um, there's kind of been two competing theories um, in our social movements about the relationship between law and sexual freedom, gender liberation. Um, and one is the one that's really visible, which is the idea that our aim should be to get existing legal structures to recognize and include LGBT people. So that means um, the focus of that formation, which is in the US has um, evolved to be, especially in the 80s, 90s and 2000s, um, white led, lawyer led um, nonprofit organizations that have done advocacy around a key set of agenda items, which were um, access to same legalized same sex marriage, the passage of hate crime laws, which are laws that um, increase the punishment if the person targeted the violence because of the person's sexuality, race, gender, et cetera. So having hate crime laws that included sexual orientation, and sometimes it also included gender identity, um, access to military service for queer and trans people, um, and the passage of employment non-discrimination laws, um, which are laws that say you can't fire someone for being LGBT or you can't, or you can't refuse to hire them. Um, so that idea, the kind of, the way we think about that is like, it's like um, a civil rights package. People often call those rights civil rights. Um, and the idea is get our lives recognized, pass laws that say it's illegal to exclude us um, and get us access to the main institutions of the society like marriage, the military and the police. So that's been the most visible um, agenda and theory 
of the relationship between bodies, law, sexuality, and gender in the last 40 years, 30 years, 40 years. Um, I, I consider that a conservative platform um, that's very invested in the US colonial state um, and in white supremacy, but it's been corporate backed. It's been the one that government actors have been the most amenable to, the kind of palatable um, one. And it's been um, very in line with the neoliberal shift in the United States during that period that has a very low horizon for what is considered change or liberation. And that tells a story about how social change happens that centers law and is like the goal of liberation is to change law. On the other hand, you have the set of left-wing queer and trans social movement work formations that I've been part of for 25 years, which think that um, our liberation will not come from having the colonial racist legal system recognize us or say that our lives are worthwhile or include us in their like deadly, horrible institutions. Um, that, that, that politics um, is explicitly coming from a lineage of um, social movements for labor, against war, against white supremacy, um, against policing and imprisonment. And that politics says, we don't wanna become police. We don't wanna call the police. We wanna abolish the police and the prisons. Uh, we don't wanna become the military. We wanna get rid of the US military. And we see US military imperialism as one of the greatest sources of violence in the world. Um, it says, we recognize that the, the kind of laws like employment anti-discrimination laws, they don't work. They were designed not to work. They've been on the books in the United States saying that that kind of discrimination is illegal against various groups, people of color, people with disabilities, women, for almost a half century. And the actual material conditions on the ground for those groups have worsened during that time because the wealth divide has worsened during that time. The criminal punishment system has been built up during that time and the border enforcement system has been built up. So conditions are worsened while the government has said, we've got this covered, we've, we, we respect you. And so we see those laws as sort of a ruse um, and we want like material change. So we have a different criteria for what winning liberation looks like. And our criteria is about the material conditions in the lives of people in our communities, especially people who are the most vulnerable. Like it, it may be that a couple of gay people are now appointed in the government or leading corporations, but if most queer people are more, are more vulnerable to arrest and detention than ever, are more vulnerable to poverty than ever, that's what we're concerned about. We want to con concern ourselves with who is facing the worst conditions and that's our barometer of change or winning. And we believe that law has a different role in those struggles than the ones we've been told by that sort of liberal rights um, framework. We think that change happens through organizing and through mass mobilization and bold tactics that are often illegal. So for example, people in our communities might be defending people against the police. We are up against law. We are um, at the, we are pushing back against law enforcement. You know, many of us are laying down in front of deportation buses and refusing to let them take people to be deported or we're um, blocking the entrances to the airports to stop deportations or we're um, in um, encampments of unhoused people protecting the encampment from the police coming to clear it. Um, and many, uh, you know, we're doing wildcat strikes, which are illegal, right? We're, so we, the law is often at odds with us. We also see the law as a limited tactic. So we might occasionally do things like try to help somebody have legal support who's facing state violence, like going through the criminal system or facing eviction. But we don't see that the answers to our community's problems are going to come from a court or from a legislature. So it's a very different relationship to law. It doesn't ignore law, but it's um, it has a, a very suspicious approach to whether or not legal reforms could are likely to be the answers. And we're interested in legal reforms that dismantle harmful systems. So we're interested in changing the city budget to defund the police, or we're interested in removing criminal laws that, that make a lot of trans people be criminalized. But we're not interested in passing laws that say that the government thinks we're good people or that we're included. 
Um, one way that I think about this is um, kind of a criteria that I think a lot of us are formally or informally using when we debate reforms. We ask ourselves questions like, does this provide material relief? Does it reach everyone in the group or only the least marginalized people? Um, does it divide us into the deserving and undeserving? Like this, you'll get to have this, but only rich people can really access it or only people with immigration status can really access it or people who don't have this kind of criminalization status. Um, and does this reform expand systems or legitimize systems that we're trying to dismantle? So for example, hate crime laws expand the prosecutor's power and we're uh, the biggest source of violence in our communities is the police and prosecutor in prisons. So we don't want to expand their power. So that's some of the analysis we use. Um, I, mean, I know my time is up, so I'm gonna stop, but I'm so excited to hear what others have to say. Thanks. Um, that's fascinating, Dean. Thank you so much for getting us off to a wonderful and robust start. Because of course, when we're thinking about body sexualities and the law, we're thinking about friction among those terms and not always congruence as well. Uh, so thank you, and we'll, we'll come back to many of the points you raised. Rahul, shall we move on to you now, please? Sure, thanks uh, Madhavi and thank you Dean for that really illuminating set of comments. Um, just a quick uh, correction to my bio, I'm based at SOAS, uh, the School of Oriental and African Studies, not uh, LSE. Now is um, SOAS going to get worried about uh, you being coached <laughs> by LSE? <laughs> no, I hope not. Um, okay. No, no, that's okay. Just in case people were perturbed, I got at least one WhatsApp message asking what's happening. Um, <laughs> But uh, thanks for this, this uh, really interesting opportunity to be in dialogue also with uh, Dean and Flavia and, uh, and you, Madhavi. Um, for the last uh, several years, I've been interested in the geopolitics of a particular law. Uh, I, my disciplinary background is in international relations and political theory, um, although I do have a law degree as well from uh, the National Law School in Bangalore. Um, and the particular law that I've been interested in is the Uganda Anti-Homosexuality Act, which was first introduced in the Ugandan parliament in 2009 and briefly for a period of six months became a law in 2014. When this bill was first introduced in the Ugandan parliament, it attracted global attention almost immediately for two reasons. First, it had some incredibly draconian provisions, some um, provisions in the first draft of the law proposed the death penalty for certain categories of offenses. And secondly, um, it, was, it was said to have been the result of lobbying by mostly US-based Christian evangelical activists who had been working closely with Ugandan priests and politicians. And this made it a kind of international story um, almost from the get-go. Precisely because of the involvement of Americans on what we might call the queer phobic side of this divide, I had not expected this to be a controversy that was amenable to be being to be framed in what Jaspi Puar has called homo nationalism, where the world is divided into parts of the world that are pro purportedly more progressive and other parts that are more regressive. And yet I was very quickly proved wrong and maybe I shouldn't have been surprised that this crisis was also framed in homo-nationalist terms because of course it was unfolding in sub-Saharan Africa, which has long been the repository for um, white Western anxieties about backwardness and primitiveness and so on and so forth. So uh, it was very clear in the earliest media coverage of this issue that um, Uganda, for example, was being framed as a kind of gay heart of darkness, quote unquote, a framing that I think is not incidental because it is geographically contiguous with, with the original heart of darkness that Joseph Conrad um, long ago wrote about. So homo, nationalism, homo nationalism was very visible in the early discussion of the controversy. And of course, it justifiably attracted critique on that ground. But I also found differently disquieting the liberal critique of homo-nationalism that began to emerge. And the reason this was troubling was because the critical accounts of what was unfolding in the politics of the Anti-Homosexuality Act seemed to completely evacuate the agency of Ugandans in this story. So that the law was read almost entirely as the result of the actions of US-based activists, as if Ugandans had no agency whatsoever in bringing about this state of affairs. 
So the question that I was first interested in was how do we tell a story about this law, the advent of this law that pays attention to Ugandan agency in the production of political homophobia without resorting to the kind of Orientalist homonationalist tropes that are so characteristic of homonationalism. And to do this in, in the early chapters of um, the books that I've just written, I try and draw attention to a series of transnational transactions between um, Western and Ugandan elites, um, both in the early colonial period at the end of the 19th century, before there was even a state of Uganda, the historic kingdom of Uganda and British elites, as well as in the contemporary 21st century moment between Uganda-based priests and politicians and the American evangelical activists that I'm talking about. Um, and this led to, I suppose, an account of the global frictions of the Uganda Anti-Homosexuality Act. There are many Ugandan scholars and activists who have been writing very illuminatingly about this controversy. And so I, I felt that my contribution was likely to be more useful if I focused on these international reverberations. So one of these, um, one set of these reverberations can be seen in the politics of the Anglican Church, which is a, a legacy of British imperialism um, and a, a, a sort of post-British imperial institution, but one in which power seems to be shifting from the Church of England to other what are called provinces of the Anglican Communion. The churches in Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda are much more powerful and influential for demographic reasons because of the ways in which um, church attendance and uh, denominational size is increasing in these countries and declining in, in the West, in the old heart of Anglican Christianity. But a different set of reverberations could be seen in Britain, the former colonial power and now a, a very influential donor state in relation to Uganda. And here we began to see in 2012 and 2017, a very peculiar discourse of atonement for what was seen as the toxic legacies of colonialism. So there were debates in the House of Lords and the House of Commons in which parliamentarians were, would stand up one after the other and, and uh, express a kind of shame and contrition for British colonialism because it was newly recognized as having left behind toxic legacies in the form of anti-sodomy laws in different parts of the Commonwealth. Now that recognition was in part urged by insistent and forceful reminders from Global South activists that these laws were remnants of a colonial penal code. But what was very peculiar about this discourse of atonement is that you didn't see similar expressions of shame and remorse and contrition when it came to the discussion of other legacies and aspects of colonialism, in particular slavery. So on the bicentenary of the abolition of uh, the slave trade in 2007, um, there was another much more wide ranging debate on, on um, the slave trade and abolition and its aftermath. And that debate is interesting. And I sort of juxtapose these different parliamentary debates because they give us ways of comparing um, you know, the, the opportunities for reckoning with the legacies of colonialism that take place within the highest echelons of the British elite. Um, these opportunities are very few and far between, but when they do happen, I think they tell us something interesting about the politics of, of the present. And when we look at the slavery uh, debates, we see that they're much more a commemoration of abolition rather than a commemoration of the fact of the slave trade and its, and its afterlives. So one of the ways in which I try and parse or make sense of the contradictions in these discourses of atonement is to show the ways in which queerness is read as whiteness. Now this is not uh, by any means an unusual or a particularly novel observation, um, particularly in the wake of queer of color critique, which has been saying this for some time. But um, I think what I'm trying to show is the ways in which this manifests itself, the kinds of historical, um, path dependencies that produce these ways in which queerness can be read as whiteness uh, in, in these um, sections of the British elite. Um, just a final um, point that I'll make, because I know my time is up. Another reverberation of this law that I look at is the reaction of the World Bank and international financial institutions, which very quickly condemned this law mm -hmm. um, through a discourse that I called homo capitalism, which I juxtaposed with Poir's homo nationalism and which I can say more about. 
And this, I think, is becoming the more hegemonic form of um, homonormativity, I would suggest, because in contrast to the civilizationist tropes of homonationalism, which talks about civilization and barbarism, homo capitalism speaks in the registers of poverty and wealth. Um, and those, I think, offer a more seductive um, way in which to persuade recalcitrant states and societies that they ought to change their laws. I'll stop here. Great. Thanks so much, Rahul, um, for such sort of, you know, a wide ranging transnational meditation on, uh, on body sexualities and the law. And again, we'll come back to many of the things you've said. We unfortunately seem to have lost Flavia, who was hanging in there um, to, you know, she was hanging in there with us until the very end. And I hope she's able to make her way back to us because Hers is a really important voice and we would very much, do very much want it to be part of this conversation. But while we're waiting for her, why don't the three of us just sort of start a, a conversation based on what, uh, what the two of you have already spoken about. And I was really struck in what both of you were saying about the role of what one can call outsourcing. There, there's a sense of outsourcing um, redress to the law, redress of material circumstances to the law in what Dean was saying. And in what Rahul was saying, an outsourcing of homophobia to other parts of the world or to the poorer parts of the world, when, of course, historically, we all know the direction in which homophobia flew, you know, uh, was flowing in the world. So, uh, so I'm just sort of interested in that idea of outsourcing, which, of course, is very much also a capitalist term. And that's what your last idea was reminding me of, uh, Rahul. So I'm just interested to hear both of you talk a little bit about that among, you know, with each other and among ourselves um, about what role you think, you know, is law, capital, global politics, why are they considered the benchmark? Why are they considered God to appeal to in times of distress? Yeah, I'll start. I mean, I think that um, that that is a that's a great way of framing it. The, the it, I think that the fantasy of law, and I want to specifically speak about the U.S. context, but I think this reverberates in in so many ways because of the fantasy of a liberal constitution. Yeah. That, you know that is in many places, but the fantasy in the U.S. is that our constitution is almost like a divine object, and if you just put the right things in, justice will flow. And so it's deeply a historical. It's, a, it's an anti-Black story in the U.S. in a very central way and a, a colonial story, right? Because it ignores that the Constitution is a document um, created and developed to maintain racialized chattel slavery and to um, ensure the, this genocidal settler project. Um, and the, the words in the Constitution are taken totally out of context, like the, what equality meant to the constitutional framers is completely different from what people want to pretend it means now. But I think it relates to... Um, like that fantasy, that anti-Black fantasy is a fantasy that the U.S. has like resolved anti-Blackness. This mm -hmm. fantasy is not actually ever provided around the genocidal um, piece. <laughs> it's just, it's only, you know, and it's like, oh, Black people were finally brought into the fold. And whether we say that's the 13th Amendment that abolishes slavery, or whether we say that's the end of Jim Crow and apartheid in the U.S., formal apartheid, of course, um, de facto apartheid still exists. Um, the story is about how the U.S. resolves using its divine legal system and that, um, and and a huge part of that story is that when the law when it, when the law changes what it says about a hated group, magically that group has a better life. And it just it's just not true. But I think in an authoritarian society, it's very desirable. So people are mm -hmm. like, well, maybe if they pass a law that says we're equal, and maybe if they pass a law that says people shouldn't beat us up and kill us, people will stop. But that just hasn't happened for any of the groups for whom such a bad law has passed. And so I think part of what's difficult is having people stop having that fantasy that I consider kind of a fantasy of a parental state with a divine neutral law and come into like, wow, like well, how can we transform the conditions of our lives? And so it's a shift from, for example, saying, if the law says you can't discriminate against people at work, it'll stop to, wow, what, kind of, what does labor organizing look like that includes a commitment to um, queer and trans people's as labor, queer and trans people as laborers, and as part of part of the struggle, you know. Um, or if the law says you can't discriminate against us in housing, then the, then the beautiful capitalist housing market will be fair, as opposed to a politics that says, "Wow, the the law around housing and land and property in the U.S. is designed to extract and exploit, and it makes it ensures homelessness for lots of people increasingly, you know, as the housing crisis mounts and as rents go up, like." 
We want something different that cannot be delivered by um, a legal framework that is designed around um, white private property rights and settler private property rights. So I think there's just like a, exactly what, that an outsourcing feeling. I really am glad you said that because I feel like it is this like, I think there's a lot of um, people in whose interest it's, it's not, like they're not gonna get what they want out of these laws, but there's a desire. Like if I were included by law, that would mean I had dignity. And that um, I think hasn't played out. And so we have to ha be strategic, like, well, what does work for our communities? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Dean. Uh, Rahul? Yeah, I like this word uh, outsourcing, Mandavi, because I think it captures what's happening at a very deep psychic level, which is this yeah. tendency to displace the things that we don't want onto the other, right? To project it onto the other. And I think that happens both at a spatial level and a temporal level. So on the spatial level, I think a lot of these, the, 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 the geography of homo nationalism, I think helps us understand the ways in which um, uh, the, these kinds of projections happen spatially, but they happen in both directions. So mm -hmm. one of the things I see both in India and Uganda, actually, in the, in the arguments between queer activists and their conservative opponents is, um, you know, the cultural conservatives will try and displace queerness, the thing they don't want, onto the West, which is seen to be corrupting the non-West in these ways. Yeah. And the activists will typically, for very good tactical reasons, will play a kind of reverse move in which they will, they try to remind us that uh, these queerphobic laws originated in the West, so actually it's the homophobia that's been imported. And in the Ugandan case, they were able to say this both by pointing to the provenance of the penal code, as we have done in India as well, but also to the provenance of the Uganda Anti-Homosexuality Act, uh, which, which was also sort of blamed on, on an external set of actors. And I think what we need are much more complicated uh, messy conversations about, which is why I'm interested in tracing these transnational collaborations between yeah. different kinds of elites that co-produce, that put into place these, whether they're colonial laws or contemporary laws or, or arrangements of capital that um, sort of put in place the structural conditions under which we labor or, um, um, you know, or, or fail to find work. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that begins to maybe. No, ab absolutely. I was sort of smiling when the two of you were speaking because it reminded me of how syphilis was considered uh, in 16th century England. It was named the French disease. And then in France, it was named the sort of Italian disease. And then in Italy, it was named something else. And so there's always sort of, it didn't come from here. It didn't come from around here, which actually also uh, talks to what both of you were talking about, the sort of profound intersection of hostility to migrants, uh, hostility to foreigners, hostility to certain kind of bodies, but fundamentally hostility to certain kinds of sexualities, which are inevitably presented as being diseased hmm. in, in one some way, shape or form, but also then the disease that didn't come from, from around here. So I just, I just find that you know, fascinating to, to think about. Um, so you know, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, but I did have another question I just wanted to throw out there. And again, both of you referred to this, uh, what we might call a sort of politics of representation. Um, and Dean said, you know, okay, now we have some gay people in office in the government. How important do you think that is or is not, uh, you know, for, for conditions on the ground? Or um, Rahul saying, what about the agency of the Ugandan people? Uh, you know, how important is representation? For instance, in, in India, you know, many of us think, for instance, that unless you reserve seats for women, you're not going, you, you're going to have a country without women in power anywhere. Uh, in many cases or in many parts of the country, especially in the North. Um, so how important do you think representation is as, leg as a legal guarantor of sexual and gendered, if not equality, sort of steps towards that? I think that um, in the US representation is a, is a mask. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a ruse. It's, um, and I think this is really important. There's a, there's an, um, a, a really important black um, queer author here um, named Kianga Yamada Taylor. She has a book called From Black Liberation to Black Lives Matter, right. um, or maybe it's the other way, but um, she, she writes about the, um, the black uprisings in the 1960s and 70s, and then the turn towards trying to elect black mayors in US cities and the ways in which those black mayors went on to enforce the exact same kinds of rules and laws and policies as their predecessor white mayors. In the US now, there's been, you know, obviously 
huge uprising against police violence and, and specifically anti-Black police violence. And the first move that every mayor does is they appoint a Black police chief to be the spokesperson, right? right. Or the rise of Kamala Harris, the vice president of the United States. This is this moment where everyone can celebrate that we have a, um, an, an Asian Black woman as vice president. She's the first in all these ways. And yet she's a former prosecutor who spent her life putting Black people behind bars. So I think that for a lot of us, there's this, um, you know, Joe Biden is, is recently appointed a trans person to the government, a gay person in these big roles. But he's also primarily um, showing in his other appointments that he's um, focused on the oil and gas industry and being there, you know, he's their handmaiden and um, he's dedicated to US military imperialism. So this move, this move of representational politics is, um, is the move, the, is the neoliberal move that says, look, we're multicultural while they continue to um, implement the exact same policies that harm the very same groups that they're saying they now represent. Like you can always find a trans or a black or native person to, to represent that politics. And I also think that even when we try to elect people who, are, who we feel are from our communities, unless there are social movements to hold their feet to the fire and to support them to do what they said they were gonna do, they won't do it. I mean, they, they, I can just give you a million examples. They yeah. don't, they, the system is, is, you know, is very efficient at putting them to work to do with the system and blocking anything different they were gonna do. And I, when I look at like Latin America, like the pink tide in Latin America, when those leftists were elected, it was only if there was still strong labor, women's, landless people's movements that they could actually implement those agendas. So for me, the representation piece is very much like mm -hmm. the, 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 the jazzy move um, mm -hmm. of sustaining the same system. Right, right. Can I just sort of jump in, Rahul, before you speak? Uh, Flavia, are you, I know you're trying to connect to audio. Well, so while, while you're doing that, Rahul, if we could just sort of quickly hear from you sure. and then hopefully yeah. Flavia. Because you brought up syphilis, I can't resist sharing a small archival moment um, where I came across a reference to gonorrhea in 19th century Buganda, which was when it when it was first uh, understood in Buganda, was also displaced and blamed on Arab visitors to the court. Right. But then the king contracts the disease and it suddenly becomes this very sexy thing to have. And people <laughs> actually compose these little rhymes about how, you know, a man who doesn't have gonorrhea is a fool, is a coward and so on and so forth. So what's interesting for me from that story is how certain imports become embraced and, yeah. um, and, and, and taken up and others continue to be rejected and displaced and other. That's right. But coming to your question about representation, I think I still find useful that famous conversation that Nancy Fraser and Judith Butler had a long time ago about representation and redistribution and um, the relationship between those two things. And here, I think I would want us to think about, of course, what happens when you have representation without redistribution, which is exactly what Dean has been talking about, the kind of elite politics of elite minor minoritarian representation which often um, is a cheap and costless way of performing progressiveness without actually shifting anything in the world. Yeah. But I think we also need to think about what happens if you have redistribution without representation, which it's harder to think of examples of that tendency, but if it did happen, would probably look like a kind of benevolent colonialism, right? Where, where, where people were given the materials, uh, preconditions of, of life, but, but actually had no uh, political role in, in mm -hmm. authoring the rules mm -hmm. by which yeah. they were governed. Right, right. Thanks, Rahul. Uh, Flavia, are you able to unmute yourself and speak? Because right now your mic is off. And I'm not sure I can unmute you. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hooray! You're back, Flavia. Please. Okay. okay. Um. Yeah, I can't see myself though. Never mind. You can hear me, right? We can see you and hear you. Okay, that's good. Um. So basically, uh, I am a women's rights activist. I am concerned with issues of gender and sexuality. And here our concern has been, um, like when I, uh, 
I've been having some internet Wi-Fi connectivity issues. But um, we can hear you just fine, Flavia. So please go ahead. Okay. So um, I've been active in this field since 1980. And as far as the women's movement goes, our concern has been how uh, women's sexuality or uh, sexual control has been the primary pillar on which uh, patriarchy is structured. So whichever uh, way we look at the law, whether it is civil or whether it is criminal, you always find patriarchy operating in favor of men and against women. So we had various cultural control mechanism about women's sexuality. And this starts with uh, uh, various kinds of cultural practices, mm -hmm. including uh, female gen genital mutilation, which is, operates in Africa, um, the foot binding cu uh, cu uh, custom of, uh, which operates in China, and the various practices like uh, female infanticide, uh, uh, this sex determination, test, selective sex determination uh, tests, and female-oriented abortions, child marriage, with a prohibition of widow remarriage, all of these actually, in a way, operate to curb women's sexuality and sexual trends. So we had a whole lot of litigation during the colonial period addressing these issues as violence against women and bringing legislations uh, to, con uh, to curb these practices. Uh, there's dowry, dowry-related deaths, various kinds of practices are there. Uh, women did not have a right for divorce, women did not have a right to own property, all of these. Now, over the years, over the centuries, in fact, many of these have changed legally. The legal mechanism has been used by uh, women's rights activists as a form of social reform and legal reform. So while we have all these in the legal arena, we do not have, uh, the culturally these practices are not ingrained and we still, still operate in a extremely patriarchal social structure. Mm -hmm. So you still continue to have the same problems. But here more insidious is the rape law because the rape law is targeted particularly to, uh, it, is, it is viewed as something in favor of women, but in fact, if you really understand the rape law, it is in favor of men and the patriarchal, uh, centering the patriarchal structure. So a rape of a woman was considered an offense against the man's ownership rights of the woman, whether it is father or husband. And here you have a, a, a kind of situation where in wars, within a, a community-based crimes, whether, whether it is um, a war situations, caste situations, in all these women are raped uh, to violate the honor of the community or the family or the husband. So here it's very important, and, and it's the women's movement also imbibe the same kind of values that uh, sexuality uh, control of uh, rape law in a way is pro women, making the laws more stringent, is in favor of women, etc. But here, what you find is each of these laws strengthening the patriarchal structure, the rights of men over women, and the entire uh, issue that is seen within the context of honor, honor of the patriarchal community structure. Now, within this, I am particularly involved with a issue which is called bar dancing. So in nine, 2005, our government brought in a legislation which is uh, to curb the practice of bar dancing. And the, this law was challenged uh, in the court by the bar owners and the bar girls. And I was involved with the campaign along with the bar girls. 
Now here, when we went to court, the various arguments you see against the um, against this kind of law to curb sexuality of women, or rather in defense of these uh, laws, were various uh, streams of thinking. One is these women are poor; they don't know what they're doing, and they're pressed into sex work. Second was these are minors who are trafficked into the city and they uh, lack the means to resist this and that's why government should step in. The third argument here was that women are, uh, women are, uh, women are enticing the men, uh, they are evil and they are um, operating in a way to um, to part men from their hard-earned money and see that after dancing, the men um, throw money at them or give them money, etc. Now, this practice of dances, the various communities were dancing communities and the women were entertainers, they were public entertainers. And it is very much um, in practice in, in the feudal culture. But when the whole social situation was changed into a capitalist culture, and the Hindi movies had these dances as item numbers, the girls migrated to the city, finding some jobs in these bars because with, with, with the skill that they already have, that of dancing. And it's very interesting that um, the various arguments that were put forward by everybody concerned was they are poor women, they are victims, they are uh, um, seeking a livelihood, uh, they are working women and their rights should be recognized. Or they are evil women and their rights should be uh, curbed and the bar dancing should be banned. I was working very closely with them and then uh, what the women felt is their erotica or their sexuality is not recognized by anyone, by any of these arguments, including the feminist argument that they are poor victims, head of their household, they are um, the breadwinners of their family, etc. So what they're saying is all that is true, but we get a lot of pleasure uh, in dancing, uh, we get a lot of pleasure in wearing beautiful clothes, well, makeup, uh, and we dance for about five to six hours every night to earn our money. So it's not easy money as it is projected. It's very hard earned money. And uh, we have developed this skill. When you see the same dances uh, in Hindi films, you do not think it is obscene. But when we do the same performances in bars, yeah. you, sometimes even as better dancers than them, so they, uh, the issue of uh, morality and sexuality comes in. So they started questioning us, saying that, why didn't you project a positive aspect of our sexuality and erotica? And why are you putting, it in, uh, uh, putting us in a victim mold when we are very uh, legitimately dancing in the bars and earning our money from our clients? And do you know what it requires? Flavis, have this. Flavis, so this interrupt. Can you hear me? I must ask you to wrap up as soon as possible because we're already running out of time. So if you could just wrap up in the next minute. This is my last, this is my last point here. So while doing this, we interacted with a lot of uh, uh, transgender communities, the Hijra community, who were also bar dancers. And that's where I came into the picture. I got exposed to this kind of sexualities. And since then, we have had some very important judgments. Hmm. One is uh, reading down section 377. The other one was NALSA judgment, which recognized third gender. And the third was privacy judgment. Again, uh, restricting the government, uh, the state uh, right to enter the private domain of uh, transgender people's sexuality. So this is where we are today, and there is a certain kind of recognition that this, these judgments have been very, uh, 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 very significant. And yet, 
the cultural milieu has not changed. The general societal hatred towards uh, commercial sex workers as well as uh, people from transgender communities continues. So that's the point I want to make here, is right. that um, we are very far from recognizing the rights of sexual minorities, as well as uh, recognizing the rights of women who do not form in the mainstream um, binaries of uh, male and female. That's, thank you so much, Flavia. I mean, what you said, I know you got cut off in the middle, but what you uh, said, resonates so beautifully with what both Dean and Rahul were talking about, not only in terms of uh, the distinction between legal realities and material realities on the one hand, but also on the other hand, the idea of can the law actually ever address eroticism and sexuality uh, without necessarily putting a moral lens on it. Um, okay, so I'm afraid we have to, not afraid, I'm delighted that we have to move on to the audience Q&A now. And so I'll invite uh, my colleagues, uh, Shiv and Shreyashi to come on board and please curate the questions for our wonderful speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you, for a really insightful conversation. And I just want to begin by, because I think in many ways, all of you spoke, focused on how law controls bodies and sexualities. And the question is about whether law defines bodies and sexualities. And particularly, one of the um, participants has asked, what is law's obsession with trans people's bodies um, and how, do, how to view it in relation to, for instance, the discourses of correctness, health of the body and how law sees it. Um, so either any of you can go first. I'll just say briefly, so, so much of my life as a lawyer has been spent um, trying to address the ways that trans people are defined um, but on um, identification papers in the US of which we have like many, many systems um, in um, prisons and jails or in medical programs that say you can or cannot have this treatment because of your um, birth gender. And I think the way that I think about it a lot is just that the point of the legal systems that I've engaged with in my life is to um, extract from people and to distribute life chances unevenly. And so ca inventing categorizations and using them to determine people's access to life chances is like the main job of those systems. Like you count as someone with a disability and you do not. You count as a citizen or a resident and you do not. You, you know, all these, and, and we have those, all of those categories are always shifting. They're all historically determined. Um, the race categories, the gender categories, et cetera. And, um, and so I think that we've, there is an interesting moment that has happened where we went from having, you know, there's a lot of the laws in the United States that did something to try to change how trans people were categorized emerged in the seventies and eighties. There was like a period of like awareness that trans people existed. And then, um, but, but in many ways, trans people have just been kind of in this like murky, like experience of you just don't count, you know, you're just only going to be seen as your birth gender, like the bulk of legal systems have said that over many years. And now there's all these efforts to make trans people recognizable in different legal systems. And some of those I would consider like kind of harm reduction efforts, like, okay, if can we get people some IDs? But I think that trans people's extreme poverty and subject um, sub being subject to criminalization here doesn't necessarily change much when we, when we, even when we win those. And also they're often not enforced because it's often something like a clerk um, who is determining whether or not you, that's at, you actually get the thing that, that says on paper you're supposed to have and, and often the people just like reject you anyway. Um, so I think it's a, it's a complex question in terms of like day-to-day -day strategy. Like, do we try to change some of these things in hopes it'll increase people's survival chances? But how do we also have like the bulk of our action be about fighting the things that are undermining the survival chances anyway? Because if you're poor and you have this idea or don't have this idea, it's not necessarily going to transform you suddenly having access to safety or housing, right? It's not that those things cannot be received through um, through those kinds of, of administrative changes. So I think this has just been a dilemma all the time. Like how do we do those immediate harm reduction methods? How do we assess whether or not they actually will reduce harm or whether they're more just kind of surface? And then at the same time, have a deeper strategy to try to transform the conditions that are um, shortening people's lives. Yeah, I, I agree with what Dean said. It, and I also think of uh, James Scott's famous book, Seeing Like a State. States are always trying to make societies legible so that they can extract stuff from people, whether that's labor or tax or whatever. Um, and so I think it's this imperative to make 
the, the, the people who are being ruled legible in order to better extract from them that is behind a lot of these systems of classification. But it's not just the state and the law, it's uh, the medical profession, it's um, the kinds of legibility that we demand of each other simply to relate to each other in, in society. I think all of these become sites of, of uh, policing in a sense um, that, that undergird these systems of, of classification. I, if I could just jump in, uh, I was really intrigued by what uh, what you said earlier, Dean, about law as a limited tactic, because I think uh, this is where a lot of the discussions in the more critical corners of the legal academy seem to hint. So there is there seems to be this sense that one can approach, if one approaches the law with this very limited sense, uh, a very clear sense that one is doing it for a very limited, almost emergency purpose we can somehow resist the ways in which the law and the state reconstitute us. Um, it, it's a tricky thing, right? One, one, one approaches the law for a limited remedy, but always runs the risk of reconstituting oneself in the ways that the law recognizes. So I'm wondering how, you know, how we navigate that, uh, that tension, you know, the situations where we don't have a choice, you know, Spivak talks about things we cannot not want. We don't have a choice but to approach the law sometimes. But how do we do that without, without running those risks? Yeah, I want to give an example about ID and surveillance. Like when I say ID, I mean identification papers, you know, driver's licenses, passports, these, you know, um, all the birth certificates. I think that one thing that many of us, one, one example of the split in, in, in the kinds of um, two takes on law that I was describing is that there are trans activists um, and lawyers who really just want us to be recognized in law and have access to the systems as they are. And then there are those of us who, um, you know, want transformation that would make us like that would address the root causes of poverty and criminalization. And so for those of us in that camp, we are concerned about the existence of ID. We, we're worried about the surveillance state, its drastic expansion with the war on terror in the United States, all the ways in which we're, um, our IDs have become increasingly, um, have had more surveillance added to them. Um, and so we're, we're not actually wanting to say like, please recognize us on our IDs and it'll be so great for the surveillance state. Like those arguments are pro war on terror, pro surveillance, but those are the arguments that you're expected to come to the government with when you're trying to get um, the ID fixed, you know, as if it could be perfect and good. And so I think this has been a question for us is how do we hold an anti-surveillance, anti-criminalization, border abolitionist, prison abolitionist politic while sometimes making the strategic, trying to remove a strategic obstacle to survival that's happening in people's lives. And I don't think there's a perfect answer to that unless we step away from just looking at the law and see it as one tactic in the movement. So what else is the movement doing? How is the trans movement opposing the war on terror? How is the trans movement, like, you know, how are, who are, who's in our, who are we in coalition with um, around migrant justice, around ending U.S. imperialism? So that, um, so that that tactic and, and even it's possible um, problems is less, you know, it's, is in a bigger container. And the other part of it is having conversations in our trans communities that you are not who the government says you are. <laughs> like we get our sense of ourselves from each other. And we may also have to navigate this messed up unfair thing where we have to hold this idea in our pocket or where we have to go through this sex segregated shelter or prison. But the real question is like, what do I need to survive right now? And not, because I think sometimes trans people even think, oh, if I could just get the ID that says this, I won't be harassed anymore. It's like, probably depending on who you are and what you look like to others and all those things, you will be harassed anyway. It doesn't matter if there's this ID in your pocket. And so how do we also have realism about the limits of those reforms or who they really work for and who they don't. And so that people also can, that desire you're describing that people have, like, I want to be recognized. I want this to be resolved. It's like, well, that's not going to resolve it. Um, it. Does it have a role? Is it a tool? Maybe. And I think that that is just a constant tension. Like, are we investing in that system when we try to make changes to it? And that's part of why I think a lot of us when in the abolition, the prison abolitionist movement, our move is to get rid of criminal laws is to oppose all criminal expansion, even if it's in the name of our communities or even if it's supposed to help women or whatever. It's like, it doesn't. Um, and so that is a different relationship to the law too. That's like, let's see, let's focus on dismantling instead of the things that harm us instead of this fantasy of being recognized. Do we have time for one last quick question, Triashi? Yeah. 
Yeah, so um, one of the audience member wants to ask, since we're talking about how, you know, try how we can reduce the tension between law and sexualities and bodies. So do you think measures like the recent Equality Act that sort of seeks to dis eliminate discrimination against the LGBTQI community in terms of housing, uh, education, public spaces, do you think such measures can sort of help us reduce this friction that we are often talking about and can they be sort of the reforms that we need because uh, it seems a little impossible to work outside the law at this point of time. So do you think they can add on to the social movements and to people's movements? And we'll, we'll have to have sort of quick, succinct answers from or responses from both of you, please. I'll just say briefly, um... No, I do, uh, the, the evidence in, in the context of the US where I am is that um, anti-discrimination laws like those are not enforced, um, they're not implemented, they're designed to make the state look like it's our protector and not homophobic instead of actually to change our lives. So I, I think it's the, I think that there's plenty of other things that we can do like dismantling the police and changing the immigration laws and all of those things that, that still involve the law, but are more um, strategic for our communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, do, I don't think the law can ever be the full answer. Uh, I mean, just thinking about the way in which we've navigated COVID um, from where I am and what I've seen, so, mama, so much of the, the work around coping with the pandemic has happened through self-organization and, and mutual aid uh, groups. And I know, Dean, you're writing about mutual aid as well. Um, it seems to me that that's, that, that that's very much alive at the moment in my mind as, as an example of the ways in which the state and the law can't, won't uh, provide the full solution to, to the things we're struggling with. Yeah, well, thank you all very, very much. And uh, I wonder if Flavia can hear us and if she can, thank you as well, Flavia. I mean, it's just yeah. fascinating. I heard it. Enjoying about. your con yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, and just sort of, uh, it's just fascinating, isn't it, to sort of think about our relationship with the law as being one almost of codependence, like we need the law, but the law might actually be more abusive than helpful um, or abusive in particular ways rather than helpful. And it's just fascinating to think about that in terms of sexuality. So thank you all three of you for really broadening horizons, providing a rich vocabulary for all of us to negotiate with and, and deal with um, in, in the coming months and years of our lives. Um, and before I end, I just want to remind all of us that our next TAP session is going to be very closely linked to our conversation today. It will be on April 9th on trans bodies and cultures. And I hope to see all of us there. Well, not to see all of us there, but all you know, know that all of you are there uh, in the participant box. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you, Flavia, for being such wonderful interlocutors of the subject. And thank you all for attending. Bye, everybody. <laughs>